This meeting is being recorded. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining. Um, I will give you a few minutes to allow for some more people to join. All right, folks, um, in the interest of time, since we only have an hour scheduled for tonight, I'm going to get started with some introductions. Um, welcome to United Solar Energy Supporters Solar Grazing Webinar. My name is Eva Hoskin. I am the Director of Uses. Thank you for joining. We have a lot of great info for you tonight, but uh, briefly, I'd like to go over a couple of housekeeping items. First off, the webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website and YouTube channel a few days following the event. Slides will also be available. If you'd like a training certificate for completing the session, please email usesny at gmail.com to request. And please give us a couple of days to fulfill the request. We get a lot of them. Um, please post your questions in the Q&A function of the Zoom so that the chat doesn't get too chaotic. <laughs> and um, if we don't finish answering questions in our allotted time, we are prepared to stay on the session longer to continue the Q&A. Second part of this webinar covering pollinators and solar beekeeping will be held April 12th, and I will post that invitation in the chat. And lastly, if you'd like to support USA's educational efforts or become a member, please visit our website and click either donate or become a member at the top of the webpage. And with that, I will pass it off to um, our facilitator, Lewis Fox of American Grazing, American Solar Grazing Association, and he will take it from here. Thank you. Hi, folks. Um, like Eva said, my name is Lewis Fox. I'm uh, on the board of the American Solar Grazing Association, and I'm part of the team at Agrivoltaic Solutions. Um, we had the privilege of being uh, a small part in putting together the Mount Morris Agrivoltaic study. Um, we're very excited to um, be able to share that with everybody. And um, we've got a number of panelists uh, that will walk through uh, some of the different parts of the study and, and explain um, what's in that. Um, firstly, we have a gift giveaway. We've got a raffle uh, for tonight. So uh, we've got some lovely handmade uh, wool coasters from uh, Ravenwood Farms in Niagara County that uh, were generously donated. Um, we'll have 10 winners um, that will each receive a pair of coasters. So the way to participate is to pick a number between one and 100 and email your uh, chosen number and your mailing address to uh, the email address there, hfarrington at gmail.com. Um, and I think we'll probably show this slide later on in the presentation as well once more to make sure we've got everybody who wants to, to enter there. So um, with that said, um, I'd like to introduce our first panelist, uh, Mr. Dave DeSalvo. He's the Deputy Town Supervisor from the Town of Mount Morris. Good evening. Thank you all for coming. Um, just like to again say thank you. But I think we'll give Dave a second here. Yeah, some technical the... difficulties. If we all turn our videos off, perhaps it will help us. Recorded. Yes. Oh, 
We can Dave, see you, Dave. Dave. You um, froze for a little bit there, so we turned our cameras off, and hopefully uh, we can hear you better this way uh, with less bandwidth being used. If you could repeat what you had just said, I'm so sorry, everyone. <laughs> Now you're you're on mute, I think, Dave. How's that? There you go. Okay, like I said, I thank everybody for coming. Um, we do have sheep farmers now in the town of Mount Morris. Um, I did when this all started with the solar. I approached Kevin and said, Kevin, there's got to be something we can do for all of these with the sheep and the solar. And this is how this project started a development. Now, here we are, and hopefully it turns out well for us all. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Um, next up, we've got uh, Kevin Campbell, who's the Senior Manager of Development at EDF Renewables and is uh, the main force behind the Morris Ridge uh, Solar Facility. Great, thanks, Lewis and, and Dave. Can you see my slide? Yes. Okay, yes, perfect. Looks good. Great, thank you. Yeah, so again, thanks, Dave and the town of Mount Morris for having the foresight and in initiative to have this study come to life. Uh, my name is Kevin Campbell, and I'm director of development for EDF Renewables. I've been involved developing solar projects for the past 12 years. Um, what I'd like to do is, is share with you some of the success stories that we've seen with uh, raising sheep around solar panels already. Um, later on, Nicole and Julie are gonna talk about uh, you know, some things that may happen in the future in, in New York State and go over the study that, that they did. Um, but I just wanted to give the picture that these things are already happen happening. There's already sheep grazing under solar panels. Uh, for example, in New York State, there's already about a thousand acres of land being used um, to graze with sheep under solar panels. Uh, EDFR has already been grazing on a site called Arm Prior near Ottawa, Ontario, on about 200 acres of land. Um, back in 2017, we were approached by a young farming couple, Chris and Lindsay, um, who wanted to grow their flock. They had about 100 sheep at the time looking to grow to about 500 sheep, but where they lived was um, the land is very expensive and they didn't necessarily want to raise their sheep indoors either. So driving by our facility a number of times, they finally decided to give us a call and we were happy to try the pilot project and put sheep under the panels. Uh, since then, it's been a great partnership between us and them. Uh, they've been grazing about 300 or more sheep under our panels every year, which takes care of all of our vegetation under the panels. And with the, the sheep they've been grazing under the panels, they've been able to produce meat that they sell to local restaurants and wool to make blankets. And on the slide here, you see there's a virtual site tour, um, a link to a virtual site tour that they prepared uh, with schools and kids asking questions as they're going through the tour. So invite you to, uh, to check out that link at some point. And also, um, before we go into um, the presentations from Julie and Nicole, I just wanted to share the benefits that are possible from bringing solar and farming communities together um, with the hope of having agrivoltaics come into the equation as well. Uh, so first of all, there's benefits for the communities. Uh, for example, the farmers who um, end up leasing their land to developers to host um, solar panels. Uh, this is an opportunity for them to earn a long-term stable revenue on their land um, and giving them the ability to keep the land in their family. And also if they're farming on other land to reinvest that income in other parts of their business. There's also uh, additional revenues possible for communities. Uh, negotiating pilot and host community agreements can increase the revenues for towns and counties and school districts by more than tenfold when comparing um, to the taxes that are paid on land with agricultural exemptions. So solar projects can pay upwards of $500 per acre per year in additional tax revenues through the pilot and host community agreements. There's also economic benefits. So jobs, for example, um, on a thousand acres of solar, we can create about 200 full-time annual equivalent construction jobs. And that's over a period of maybe one or two years. 
during operation, there's two or more full-time jobs per thousand acres of land. And that number can more than double if we're gonna be hosting sheep or providing other forms of agrivoltaics on the site. There's also benefits to the local economy. Um, the local revenues estimated are about two to $3,000 per acre per year uh, with a solar facility on, on the land. And those revenues come from uh, landowner payments, pilot host community payments, employee salaries, cost for maintaining vegetation, roads, fences, equipment, et cetera. And looking at um, the 2017 survey on agriculture in some of the counties in which we're developing across New York State, uh, typical revenues from the farmland itself averages between $500 and $1,500 per year. So, uh, so with solar on, on those properties, um, there's a lot more revenue possible for the local economy. There's also uh, conservation benefits. So for example, the soil, um, developers need to preserve topsoil so the land can be returned to farming at the end of the life of the solar project. And there's very strict guidelines that developers need to follow during construction, operation, and decommissioning. And in a sense, though the solar panels are on the land for you know, 20, 30 or more years, this can be seen as a form of farmland conservation because the land can also be returned to farmland and it's also, it can also be used for farming while the solar panels are there. There's also the potential for improved stormwater retention and filtration because there's vegetation on the site all year round. And also, as we're gonna talk about in this presentation, agrivoltaics is a huge part of, of all of this as well. Um, there's opportunities for grazing around the solar panels, for raising crops around the solar panels, also for hosting pollinators and providing ecological services for the areas around the project. And again, grazing can help improve the soil long-term. Uh, we can increase carbon sequestration and soil health, having the appropriate vegetation growing around the panels. And if we include grazing with that, um, they'll add additional nutrients to the soil as well. Uh, so the last point I have here is around uh, technology. And every year, the efficiency of solar panels gets better and better. And for example, from 2011 to 2019, um, the, the median power density of solar increased by 50%, which means we need to use less and less land every year to make the same amount of energy. And so with that, um, I'll turn it back over to you, Lewis. Thank you for listening. And Thanks very much, Kevin. Uses does have something to add to these slides as well. Um, Based on what we've been hearing while working on the ground with farmers, we also want to address and some overlapping points here, but um, we want to address the importance of how solar does reduce flooding and stormwater compared to hosting row crops on land. Um, and this is also due to the requirement for solar sites to host native vegetation and meadows year round. Um, and with this reduced pesticide and herbicide use on solar facilities reduces contamination in stormwater. So helping to keep wells and streams clean. And solar also improves habitats for at-risk pollinators, leading to better food production, which will be explored further at our event in April. And I hope that you all saw the invitation to that in the chat. Um, and lastly, that decommissioning plans and regulations are um, do ensure that equipment will be removed at the cost of the solar company at the project end of life assuring that there will be no cost to the landowner or community. And again, these were just some points that uses wanted to add in um, based off of what we've been hearing in our experience on the ground lately. So you can find more information about this on our Ag Plus Solar webpage um, on our website under the education tab. And thank you very much. And with that, I will once again, pass it back to Lewis. Thank you, Eva. Um, our next presenter is Julie Shiflett. Uh, she's the owner of Juniper Economic Consulting, and she'll have more to share on the grazing enterprise budgeting that was done as part of this study. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Lewis, and thank you, Eustace, for the invitation. Let's see, slideshow. Can everybody see my slideshow? Yes, we can, Julie. Yep. All right, thanks again, Lewis. Um, my name is Julie Shiflett and I'm an independent consultant 
I have consulted for the American Sheep Industry Association, however, for the past 19 years, and I was very pleased to be part of this project. Let's see, my slides are not advancing. Oh, there we go. Whoops. All right. Thank you again for coming. It's great to be here co-locating solar and agriculture at the Morris Ridge Solar Energy Center. This project can really transform the sheep industry, solar energy in general and utility scale in particular. U utilizing sheep and agrivoltaics through solar grazing offers a unique opportunity for the US sheep industry to expand production and also can reverse the course of an industry, the sheep industry that has been contracting. Our agenda today, our objective, my primary objective in the study with my colleagues was to estimate an enterprise budget to determine the profitability of utility scale solar. We will go through the method, existing literature, results and our conclusion. But first some background, let's see. Solar grazing opportunity. A little bit of background first before we get into our uh, study objective. Sheep production in the United States has been in the decline over the past few years. The reasons for this contraction, there are many and varied reasons for the decline in the sheep industry flock. Sheep operator retirements. In general, the average age of a sheep operator is perhaps in the high 60s. And there are fewer and fewer in the younger generations that want to get involved in sheep. Predator concerns. Predator concerns, an ongoing concern. Every year, the US sheep industry loses a significant number of sheep and younger lambs to predators, anywhere from coyotes to bears. Labor concerns, also an ongoing concern in the industry. Um, particularly with the availability and the cost of labor. The H-2A guest worker program is very beneficial to the U.S. sheep industry. However, in some Western states in particular, the, the cost and availability of laborers, sheep herders in particular, has been increasing. Lack of markets is also another concern. Um, as the U.S. sheep industry has consolidated, and the lamb packers have gotten larger, processing larger volumes of sheep. Um, some um, local processing facilities have closed down as well as auction markets. So in general, with industry consolidation, there have been fewer marketing opportunities for some producers. Import competition. In general, in the United States, imports have been increasing dramatically over the last 10, 20 years imports primarily from Australia and New Zealand. And um, in general, some of those imports have um, displaced the shrinking availability of domestic lamb. However, opportunities exist. It's not all doom and gloom. Consumer demand for lamb is strong and particularly strong in the last couple of years um, during our pandemic. Um, I have not seen a, a quantitative analysis for a number of years, but anytime you have more lamb being sold at equal or higher prices, it's highly suggestive that lamb demand is expanding. So are mo more people are consuming lamb. Um, and the environmental story of going solar and replacing mechanical mowing is critical to this demand story. So I'm very optimistic about lamb demand in the United States. It's been very strong the last couple of years and I, I fully anticipate the strength to continue. So, and also another bright side, even though we see national industry numbers contract, there are pockets of growth. New England has seen some recent growth in flock numbers, Pennsylvania, Great Lakes, Colorado and the desert states. And we've also seen flock stabilization in the mid-Atlantic states, such as North Carolina, as well as Texas, our largest sheep producer. So there are pockets of growth, um, although we've seen some small contractions in the total inventory numbers. To meet this growth, as I mentioned, US imports over half of 
lamb consumed domestically. Over half of the lamb that we eat domestically comes from Australia and New Zealand. In 10 years, 2011 to 2020, lamb imports jumped 65%. On average, we import over 300 head of lamb each month into United States. So there is a capacity to grow our domestic lamb supplies. Consumers are eating that much lamb. We are consuming, um, excuse me, half of what we consume domestically is being imported. Okay, now to the study objective. We're going to estimate solar grazing profitability from co-locating sheep grazing with utility scale um, solar sites. And what, what we mean by utility scale is a much larger scale. Um, our study in, in, in looks at over a thousand acre site, the Mount Morris study. The method, um, we're gonna use, estimate our enterprise budgets from primary and secondary data. And we'd like to credit um, our survey of current solar grazers in, on our study team, um, US Department of Agriculture market data from lamb markets, um, livestock market information center out of Denver, and then um, some past work by Agrovoltaic Solutions was instrumental in getting us going, um, some work that they did for EDF renewables, and then also existing solar budgets. So there are a number of secondary studies, existing solar budgets. However, the scale of these studies is relatively small compared to the scale of our study. We'd like to credit the 2021 American Solar Grazing Association study on 25 acres, 2021 North Carolina Cooperative Extension Service study also, and then um, a couple studies out of Cornell and this one in particular conducted in 2018 on 22 acres. So there are limited number of existing budgets and you'll see that the scale of these is relatively small, about 22 to 25 acres compared to our study which is a utility scale study at over a thousand acres. Our study team decided to estimate profitability for two different scenarios, two models on this proposed 1,060 acre site. Model A is where the, the sheep producer or grazier pur purchases lambs for grazing and sale. Lambs are purchased for grazing through the season and then a portion are sold during the summer with the remainder sold in the fall. The reason we have the staggered marketing approach is that the pressure on the solar site um, may deplete or reduce the forage quality and quantity. And so you, we recommend a staggered marketing approach where you can relieve some of the pressure on the forage supplies and sell off lambs through the growing season. Lambs will be sourced out of state. We're looking at a significant influx or import of lambs. And we do have those numbers, perhaps not immediately locally in, in New York state, but in the Midwest. Two revenue streams are projected, the grazing income, and then also revenue from the lamb sold. The second model B, is very different. In this case, the grazer grazes own flock of ewes and um, will subcontract out the remaining vegetation removal. So the sheep producer will graze his or her own flock and then subcontract out any remaining um, vegetation removal. In this case, this could possibly generate a new revenue stream the compensation from grazing from the solar developer. This could help um, interrupt the parasitic life cycle on the sheep producer's own farm, and then also enable the producer to do something else with his, his or her own lands, land, such as stockpile forage for winter while the flock is on the solar site and not on his or her own property. Key assumptions. 
Please remember with any enterprise budget, you always want to look at the key assumptions and your anybody's assumptions may differ. We had to make a number of assumptions because again, we did not, there is not a lot of enterprise budget uh, literature and definitely not at the utility scale um, size. So again, to re remember, this is over a thousand acre site. For the model in which you graze lambs, we estimate nine lambs per acre. And then the second model, model B, 2.5 ewes per acre. And these are our stocking rate assumptions. In general, stocking rate is the number of animals per the thousand acres. Stocking density looks more at the number of animals in a given paddock, for example, for a given time. So stocking density looks at more of the concentration of animals over a particular period of time, a given time. We assume that ewes and lambs will rotate from pasture to pasture. And the rotation is up to the grazier. It might be a, a few days, for example, before you move your flock. As lambs gain weight, we assume pressure on the site's pastures will increase. We also assume production of a grass-fed local lamb that is environmentally and agriculturally sustainable. We made the assumption that we will graze hair lambs. Therefore, you will not have wool sales nor pelt sales. Model A, grazing lambs for sale. Just a quick overview. We'll purchase lamb at about 35 pounds. And again, these are just our simplifying assumptions from the Midwest where they do have sizable flocks um, for grazing in about May. Graze lambs for about five months on the solar site. However, we recommend a staggered marketing approach whereby lambs gain weight and pressure on forage increases and you will sell off some of the lambs. The remainder of the lambs will sell in about October or November at about 80 pounds and you will not winter lambs um, for the remainder of the year. Operating expenses for our Model A, sheep, labor, and other. Um, sheep represented about 72% of our operating expenses, um, particularly purchasing lambs. That's a sizable expense. Labor will require hired labor. It will require labor for our rotational grazing recommendation, moving the flocks from paddock to paddock will be labor intensive, in addition to payroll taxes. Other, shipping will be a sizable expense if you're bringing lambs from the Midwest. Fuel and oil, livestock guardian dogs are recommended depending on your predator problem. Fencing, we do assume that the solar developer provides perimeter, excuse me, um, fencing around the perimeter of the grazing site, but the interior fencing, the electronic fen uh, fencing will be moved and that will be some cost. And that represents about 11% of your operating expenses. Again, we made a number of simplifying assumptions. I will not go through these line by line, but they are available in the, the report. Um, so all of our estimates in the end of profitability are dependent on our assumptions here. You can see how much we paid for hired labor. You can see how much we compensated the grazier, for example, how much we paid for transport, a lot of different assumptions and um, secondary research and expert opinion went into defining all of these assumptions. Okay, grazing lambs will require a considerable investment. We assume that this is a, a grazer, not necessarily a, already an existing producer. So think of a grazer that's starting from scratch that wants to um, get into solar grazing. Will require a truck, livestock trailer, ADV, fencing for paddocks, again, the interior fencing, the electro net, for example, and depending on water availability, water totes and a pump. Again, with any solar site, there will be a negotiation of, between what the solar developer will provide in terms of startup investment, and then what the grazier will bring to the site. Portable handling equipment, livestock guarding dogs, signage is important around the perimeter, 
to let the community know what's going on, and, it, and in particular, um, to alert the community that livestock guardian dogs are there. Mower and trimmer. We estimate that the sheep will do an excellent job of keeping the vegetation down. However, there might be a small percentage of mechanical mowing and trimming that is required. And therefore we recommend that the grazier have some mowing and trimming equipment. Let's see, going backwards. Okay, estimated returns. Net farm income, which is returned to unpaid family labor and management is $35 per head. If you reduce it by depreciation, it's an estimated $33 per head for the lambs. When you incorporate payment or compensation to the grazier, you drop it, your estimate down to $26 per head. When you pay yourself as the grazier and compensate the grazier for grazing the lambs, estimated profitability drops to $26. So the project is overall profitable, quite profitable given our estimates. Estimate per head $26 per lamb. Return on investment, again, our estimate, there is a sizable upfront cost, a quarter million dollars, approximately $247,000. Annual rate of return is 95% and years to pay off the investment 1.05. Model B, again, Model B is grazing your own sheep. We're assuming that a producer is grazing his or her own sheep and then subcontracting the remainder vegetable, excuse me, vegetation removal to other grazers. Uh, allows the sheep producer to add a revenue stream, allows the sheep producer to utilize existing home base for hay production or other agricultural activities during the grazing season when his or her flock are at the solar site. So it opens up a possible secondary revenue stream um, at the home base while the flock is on the solar site. By comparison to Model A, grazing own use and subcontracting additional use provides higher estimated returns, primarily because the grazer is not purchasing lambs. The investment is about 20% of Model A, so the upfront costs are considerably lower and also the assumed grazer has lower operating costs because lower cost shipping charges when utilize your own use. So we're imagining that a regional producer grazes his or her use, which is an older lamb on the site, and um, therefore the shipping is quite lower. However, additional expense is payment to subcontracted graziers. Let's look at some numbers here. Again, we made some simplifying assumptions. Um, please refer to the, the report for our assumptions here. And um, all these estimates are variable depending on our assumptions. Net farm income, 96.44. Profit per acre, profit per acre when you include compensation to the grazier drops to $33.67. So again, healthy returns. Total investment is much lower at 55,000, even though we're assuming that a sheep producer will um, take on the primary contract with a solar developer, there are still some, um, some capital upfront costs that will be required. Annual rate, rate of return is a little bit lower than model A at 65% and years to pay off investment one and a half year. So very similar to um, model A, except that the returns are um, a little bit higher here and the upfront cost is considerably lower. Conclusions. Solar grazing can introduce thousands of lambs into New York State, a region that is a net importer of lamb. A lamb demand survey, which Nicole will present next, revealed that the regional food service sector already loves American lamb, 
and appreciates the story of locally sustainably produced lamb. Production of grass-fed local lamb can be environmentally and agriculturally sustainable. Solar grazing lambs offer a viable option for reducing net carbon emissions and combating climate change, thereby justifying agrivoltaics. Last, solar grazing can stimulate local and regional economic development and jobs. As part of our study, we estimated the total number of jobs, which came to six, a uh, total number of jobs is six that can be, can be created by running uh, sheep on this solar site. So there's a important multiplier effect creating jobs in direct and indirect linkages throughout the regional economy. Where to find the study? At the Town of Mount Morris website. And here is the, the link for the study. It is titled, titled Agrivoltaic Study on the Mount Morris homepage. I'd like to thank our study partners, Sean Grasby at the Town of Mount Morris, Kevin at EDF Renewables, Lexi and Lewis from Agrivoltaic Solutions and also our, our sheep producers and grazers, Nicole with Lechway Gateway Villages and, and um, who conducted the lamb demand study, Mary Kate, who did the beekeeping and was a valuable resource in editing, and then Nick, our project manager, and Rochelle, also our project manager with uh, Compass Energy. Thank you all for participating. I was really excited to be part of this study, and I, for a, a long time, um, sheep economist, for a lack of a better word, it's very exciting to see this kind of demand potential for the industry. And I, I firmly believe that this can turn the, the industry around for lamb because more and more people are, are loving and enjoying lamb. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Julie. That was tremendous. Um, I think I, I really enjoyed uh, learning all of that and, and hearing that presented. And um, I think everybody else did too. Um, our next panelist is Nicole Manipal. She's the director of Letchworth Gateway Villages, and she will be presenting on uh, the marketing analysis. Thank you, Lewis, and thank you, Julie. Um, that was a great setup for this segment. Um, with you know the time that we have remaining, I, I won't go into a lot of detail. Um, I really encourage folks to go to the link that Julie um, showed and I think that uh, Ava has put into the chat to read more about the study. But essentially, as Lewis was saying and Julie, uh, my name is Nicole Monopol. I'm the director of Letchworth Gateway Villages. Uh, this is a municipal collaboration that uh, the town of Mount Morris actually helped found it uh, a, a few years ago. And we are a municipal alliance that is committed to advancing rural development in the Genesee Valley region. And we do this through a number of activities, including network building, technical assistance, and research. And why we got brought into this, um, for the last few years, we've really been looking at the potential of the sustainable tourism and outdoor recreation economy in this area. And a core part of that is uh, food and you know, our strengths as an agricultural region. And so in 2019, we actually did a food tourism assessment that looked at you know, the potential of doing more kind of farm to table um, uh, types of restaurants and uh, food tourism in the region. And there's certainly a growing demand for that. And so lamb, uh, solar raised lamb really fits into that, that picture. Um, and so what we really wanted to look at with this is, you know, this understanding that, you know, the success of solar grazing really depends on creating a strong market for lamb and um, other products that would be generated from solar grazing. So in a few weeks, we're going to be talking about the, um, the beekeeping um, uh, piece of all of this. Um, but we really wanted to better understand um, the barriers to market penetration for New York solar raised lamb. Um, and for this reason, we were contracted to look at uh, local demand using our resources and, and our networks. Um, I'm just going to share my screen and turn my video off. So hopefully we can preserve some bandwidth.
All right. Lewis, can you see my screen? Yes. Excellent. Looks good. Okay. So this first slide here is, um, you know, kind of the, the big picture view. Um, and so the, the research that we conducted was both looking at kind of what the market looked like for the U.S. as a whole. Um, and data collected for this was done through a combination of desktop research, um, the USDA, and um, sources like the uh, American Land Board. And as Julie was saying, what, you know, the, the big story here, there's a lot of data on here, but, you know, lamb consumption is, is growing in the United States. Uh, right now, most of the lamb that we consume is coming from Australia and New Zealand. Um, and again, if we start thinking about carbon emissions and um, you know how uh, shipping and so forth is is impacting the environment um, and carbon, um, you know thinking about a locally raised source, um, even if it is more expensive, is is something certainly we should be considering. There are three main land markets, so. Um, you know the largest market is kind of your mainstream food service and retail. Um, the second and la uh, second largest market that we're going to be talking a little bit more on um, is the ethnic food service and retail. This has huge potential in New York State um, uh, for a number of reasons that I'll get into in just a little bit. And then the third category is direct to consumer uh, farmers markets. Um, and again, this is kind of a space to watch with uh, the the pandemic. Um, what we're seeing um, since, you know, restaurants and other kind of uh, places have been closed uh, is more direct to consumer, um, uh, you know, purchasing and um, and sales. And so this is one of the fastest growing segments, and it'll be interesting to kind of see where this goes as, as we move through this, um, through COVID. And the other kind of key takeaway here is that, you know, demand for lamb tends to be seasonal. So you have, you know, higher demand around springtime, um, around some of the, you know, Western and Greek holidays with Easter, um, uh, some of the Muslim holidays, uh, Eid al-Fitra and Eid al-Aida, um, that tend to be around the summer, but those change also. Um, and then December holidays, you know, um, our typical, um, you know, Christmas, uh, and other um, holidays in the winter. So the, also another piece of good news is that, uh, you know, one of the strongest markets for lamb is the Northeast and New York City. And this has historically been, you know, kind of where the strongest demand for lamb exists in the US. Um, again, a lot of data on here, but the key takeaway is that um, you know we're really in a good position being in New York State with our proximity to New York City um, and also with with Toronto um, and other you know kind of major metropolitan areas within a five hour radius from where we are um, for uh, raising more lamb. Finally, um, you know our our demand here in um, our local area. So we did two kind of surveys. So one was a local um, restaurant survey. We looked at 62 restaurants, um, distributors and retailers uh, in our region. So this included the Genesee Valley, but also um, places in Rochester in the nearby Finger Lakes. Um, we've got about a 34% response rate. Um, which wasn't bad, but obviously, you know, I think more, um, you know, research and data would be good uh, as you move forward. And the main respondents tended to be chefs and, and, you know, people who were in the food, um, you know, kind of restaurant industry. And um, we surveyed a number of different types of restaurants, so including ethnic fine dining, farm to table, and delis. And again, um, the overall picture here is really positive. So, you know, um, I was surprised at how many um, restaurants already serve lamb and serve it year round. So you're looking at 93% of the restaurants we surveyed um, have lamb on their menu and 73% serve lamb year all, all year round. 47% um, reported increased sales within the past five years, which again aligns with some of that other data that I was showing you earlier about just the, the you know, general trend for, for lamb in our, in our market. Um, 
67% responded that their customers care where their lamb is sourced. So this was a huge um, kind of finding in, in some of the research that we had was that, um, you know, people really care about where their food is coming from. Um, and I think that's really increased again since the pandemic when, um, you know, people were really struggling to source their meat. Um, and so it really provided an opportunity to create closer ties with local producers. I, I certainly know anecdotally from, you know, farmers that, um, you know, are in my network here, their sales uh, increased during the pandemic. And then the 53% um, um, purchase U.S. over local, um, would purchase U.S. Uh, or local lamb over an imported product if given the opportunity. So, one of the things that um, you know we heard from from restaurants and something that we'll need to be paying attention to as we grow this market if we pursue this is um, you know kind of price continue to be an important factor for a lot of our you know our area here that's still rural um, people don't you know um, have you know huge incomes and so price is is still an issue um, Consistency, both in availability and product, um, was something else that uh, the um, survey respondents cited as being important. Um, but overall, you know, they were interested in, you know, continuing to be linked into this um, and interested in, you know, kind of seeing where this goes and would be interested in buying it if this, this type of land, lamb became available. So the second survey we did was an informal phone survey um, with uh, different um, uh, markets, um, ethnic markets um, in, um, in around New Jersey and um, uh, kind of New York, the New York City area. And the purpose of this was to really try to just start to get a sense of what the ethnic demand would be for um, in New York State for, for lamb. And, you know, again, um, with our proximity to New York State, or sorry, New York City, um, this presents a really um, great opportunity. Um, the types of lambs that we are producing or you know, using for grazing under solar here um, are smaller breeds. And so this is exactly the type of lamb that a lot of these ethnic markets um, prefer um, to you know, a regular kind of fine dining restaurant. Uh, and so, um, you know, those are those are some opportunities uh, uh, for us in the future. And I think that, um, you know, again, um, there seems to be, you know, less barriers to entry uh, for, you know, taking lambs to the ethnic markets. One of the, the second largest um, is in New Holland, uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, the largest is in San An Angelo, Texas. Um, so we really do have an opportunity um, with our proximity to New York City and those markets to be looking at um, how we service uh, the ethnic food market. So one of the barriers that we've seen um, is regional processing capacity. And again, we didn't do a thorough investigation of um, this aspect, but again, anecdotally talking to producers, um, this was um, a concern um, if we were, act were going to ramp up the um, kind of production of, of lamb in our area, we'd need to have, we'd need to also increase regional processing capacity. But this, interestingly, is not an issue when we're talking about, um, you know, selling it live kind of auctions in ethnic markets. So again, something to consider as, as we go forward. Um, and just to kind of sum everything up, you know, I think with, um, you know, the Finger Lakes wine region becoming more and more of a, a food destination, um, we're seeing, uh, you know, uh, changes in both the Buffalo and Rochester markets, our proximity to Toronto, New York City, um, and other metropolitan areas really sets us up for um, some opportunities to, you know, lead in the space going forward. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to pass it back to, to Lewis um, and hopefully leave some, some time for questions. But again, I really urge anyone who's interested in really digging into the, to the data to read the study. Um, and of course, uh, we can be contacted uh, through Ava and others if you have questions um, on uh, especially the local demand that we were 
we were researching. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. That was a great presentation. Um, now uh, we are going to look at moving on to question and answer time. Um, everybody is going to have the opportunity to put questions down in the Q&A box. Um, we're obviously getting close to the top of the hour, but we're going to try to just keep going and get through as many of these questions as we can. Um, looks like we've got about 24 right now. So I'm going to um, start at the top and, and throw a question out. Um, and the first one is from Nigel and it is typically how much would the landowner charge the sheep farmer for grazing rights on the solar farm? Um, and I don't know who wants to take that first one. I would say maybe Julie or Kevin. Yeah, sure. I can, I can start with this answer. Um, yeah, I think there's really going to be some price discovery in this in this domain. Um, I think we've seen, you know, Lewis, correct me if I'm wrong, but prices around three hundred to five hundred dollars per acre on some smaller sites, and the price discovery is going to happen as we start to see larger and larger facilities across um, the Northeast. You know, this this facility here, Morse Ridge, is a thousand acres, and will that drive economies of scale and a lower price? Um, I think, realistically speaking, the, the solar grazers are offering a vegetation management service, just like the landscapers and lawnmowers are doing. So there'll be some competition there. But we know we've been contacted by at least half a dozen different farmers, um, who all, some of who already grazed, some of whom had lamb you know, 10, 20 years ago and are looking to get back into it. So we know there will be some competition on some of the sites. and. We're really looking forward to um, to this partnership being successful and going forward. Thanks, Kevin. Um, and and I would just add to that that typically uh, um, these contracts are between the site owner um, and the sheep farmer. Um, so that's that's the most common. And, and typically, obviously, the site owner will be leasing land. So generally, not uh, a contract between the landowner um, themselves and the sheep farmer, but it is. Um, a paid contract um, that is income going from the, the site owner to the farmer. Thank you both. I just would like to add for our particular study, we estimated $250 per acre for grazing lambs as compensation from the solar developer. Okay. Um, Let's go to the next one. This might be another Kevin question. Can you share your math on how much land it takes per unit of solar energy? I've been finding different numbers in different sources and get asked about it frequently. So how much land it takes per unit of solar energy? Yeah, so about 10 years ago, it took about 10 acres for one megawatt of solar. Um, as I mentioned, the efficiency of solar panels have been getting better and better. Uh, today, we need about six acres of land to make a megawatt of, of solar energy. So um, hopefully that number continues to go down in the future. Thanks, Kevin. Um, our next question here is from Jerry Wiley. Uh, how does this type of grazing affect the methane emissions from sheep, which are ruminants and typically have high emissions above beef? Um, I don't know if there's somebody else that wants to grab this. Uh, let me know. Um, I can begin to address this um, without having specific data uh, to point you to off the top of my head. Um, I think what we're looking at um, with sheep grazing, I don't know if this is, you know, sheep versus beef or sheep under solar versus sheep in a normal pasture setting. Um, but, um, you know, sheep obviously have methane emissions like any ruminant. Um, so when we look at grazing management, um, we look at managing the grazing um, to allow rest periods for plants to regrow and build root matter and um, you know, hopefully sequester some carbon underneath the ground to balance out um, the methane emissions that they do have 
Um, so, you know, the way that I would look at it as a sheep farmer, or a grazer would just be um, trying to manage the grazing um, to, you know, minimize uh, the balance of methane to carbon sequestration. And I couldn't say off the top of my head, I know that there is some research beginning to come out um, on quantifying that carbon sequestration. Um, and, um, you know, so that would probably be the, uh, the avenue to go down to, to try to learn some more about that. And just on that, Lewis, as well, we have to remember that grazing sheep under panels is also replacing you know, mowing using, you know, diesel or gasoline uh, equipment. And also if we're producing uh, lamb with the, as a byproduct, it's potentially offsetting the import of lamb coming from Australia and New Zealand, um, which is also a transportation greenhouse gas emission savings. That's a great point. All righty, um, from Dave. Have you received any substantive uh, feedback from the New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets regarding their stance on the validity of sheep grazing or other co-located agricultural practices as mitigation effort for solar use on current agricultural property, specifically from Mike Saviola or any of his, his associates? Um, Kevin, would you like to take that one? Yeah, personally, I haven't received any um, recent feedback but we know that there are some out there who see solar grazing as maybe not being an intensive use of the land. Um, however, I think we have to remember that there's a lot of land across New York, uh, not New York State, but across the United States that's used to produce fuel. And, and solar also produces fuel in electricity format versus a biofuel format. And it's a very efficient way to use land for fuel. Um, for example, you can drive a car 100 times further uh, with, with an acre of solar panels than you can with an acre of corn, for example, going to, to ethanol. So um, there's, there are some, some you know, benefits to, to solar um, and, and its land use, uh, despite using sheep or crops or other forms of agrivoltaics underneath those panels. And I think we're going to go over right now to uh, Eva that may have some results from the raffle. Yeah, folks. So um, it is 7 p.m. ish, and um, that is the official end time for this webinar. Um, so I'd like to announce the giveaway winners. But first, I do want to reiterate that we will continue with Q&A um, for the next 30 minutes or so, since there are still a lot of questions remaining. Um, we are prepared for that. and. Um, Without further ado, here's the giveaway winners. And I am so, so terribly sorry if I pronounce any names incorrectly. Um, the winners are James McCall, Gary or Jerry Wiley, um, Jen Crawford, Vincent Petruzzolo, Mary Wyland, Ralph Hoffman, Jerry Guinea, Chris Carrick, Nikki Sorrento, and Mark Petrowski. So this um, number that we were all trying to reach was 38, and it was chosen by one of USA's technical advisors, Haley Farrington, who is the person that you were all emailing. So um, if I read off your name, you will be receiving a um, set of coasters in the mail in the very near future. So thank you guys so much for participating and also being here. And I will pass it back to Lewis for the rest of the Q&A. Thank you, Eva. And congratulations to the winners. Um, the next question, uh, I think this has been answered, this one from Nigel. Um, I think we'll skip down to Dave DeYoung. Have you explored any other methods for agricultural mitigation on solar sites other than just sheep grazing? Are there any other products or methods that can be co-located? Have you received any input from NYSDAM regarding these products? Um, I can answer some of this um, and then I'll let anybody else who wants to take up um, an ad. Um, so there are um, a number of different 
lines of inquiry that are happening right now um, into agrivoltaics and co-location of agriculture. Um, some of the other um, more prominent ones would be um, beef grazing in arrays with raised racking. Um, there are ex there's exploration into vegetable production. Um, there's exploration into small grains production. Um, and, you know, a number of other, you know, crops like that, that are typically hand harvested, um, and can be grown in partial shade. Um, one of the, one of the more, one of the methods that we do see, um, in use, uh, on active solar sites right now, um, that's actually being done to some extent on the EDF Arnprior site that Kevin had presented on earlier um, is making hay in between panel rows. This can be done on some sites depending on the panel spacing. Um, and in that case, uh, the site operator, the, the site operators and the grazers use that as a way to manage forage growth through the more productive parts of the year and balance the amount of sheep they have on the site. Um, so you know, in that case, and in a lot of the other cases, there is some need for specialized equipment. Um, so there's different, you know, lines of inquiry and exploring how to do production of those products more efficiently and, and what the equipment is and other considerations um, to do that effectively. But it is certainly being explored um, on a number of fronts. Um, and if if Kevin or anybody wants to add anything, go ahead and otherwise, um, yeah. Yeah, I guess just quickly, one of the other benefits of, of putting crop under solar panels or vegetation under solar panels, um, we did a pilot in France with alfalfa, for example, and, and the amount of yield we got under solar panels compared to the test plot um, was lower earlier in the season, but as the summer and fall came around, um, the alfalfa outperformed the test plot because it was partially shaded. There was less evaporation and better water retention under the solar panels. So it just allowed for, I guess, a more sustainable crop of alfalfa longer in the season. Thanks, Kevin. Um, this next one might be going to you as well. Have you explored land trust mitigation banking credit purchases for agricultural mitigation for solar sites? Yeah, no, we haven't. Um, yeah, we have not investigated that. Um, however, I, I, I feel like solar is a way to conserve farmland long term by putting panels on top of it. Um, the soil underneath, like I mentioned, is is retained. It, it's segregated during construction and protected. And um, as part of decommissioning a solar facility, the land can go back into farming again. So I feel it's a long term form of farmland conservation. Thanks, Kevin. Um, our next question is from an anonymous attendee, and I think this may go to Julie. Um, what is meant by forage pressure when it comes to two different to the two different grazing models? Is it assumed that the solar site is mowed during this time, or is it that grazing is removing more vegetation than the site can keep up with? Hi, that's a, a great question. Um, and perhaps I didn't fully explain, as the lands are gaining weight, the pressure on the forage will increase. And so they'll be consuming more and more daily. They'll grow quite rapidly. Um, and so the pre we assume that, that alone, the, that the pressure will increase from the increased intake by the lands. Um, we do assume that the areas, the paddocks will be mowed down and we will be rotating from um, paddock to paddock, which is a smaller unit of area. And so um, hopefully that explains it's the growing lamb that will increase the pressure on the forage. Yes, because we're going from about a 35 pound lamb to an 80 pound lamb. And therefore we recommend a staggered marketing approach where you alleviate some of that pressure on the land because um, you know, 9,000 lambs at 35 pounds each is very different from 9,000 lambs at uh, 50 to 70 to 80 pounds each. So the pressure on the, the forage is quite different. Hopefully that, that helps. Thanks, Julie. And I think um, 
the next one. There's three in a row that are uh, asking about hair sheep versus wool sheep. Um, what is the advantages of hair sheep to wool sheep? Why only hair sheep? Um, and does this include, this does not include wool, is that correct? So um, would you like to talk a little bit about hair sheep versus wool sheep? Yeah, this is a um, great questions. And um, the US sheep industry has seen um, a growth of hair breeds and hair sheep such as Katahdin and Dorper um, grow hair, not wool. So the wool, there is no wool to shear. So if you choose a hair breed, you do not need to shear wool. You do not need to, to market wool, for example. Another reason that people prefer hair breeds in some parts of the country is because they are deemed more parasite resilient. So again, your choice of hair or wool breeds might depend on where you live. Um, in the drier climates of the Western United States, the wool breeds are very popular, such as Merino, Rambouillet, Targhee, for example. But in some parts of the country, we've seen a real revolutionary switch to hair breeds, such as in Texas. In, in Texas and in West Texas, we used to have predominantly wool breeds, and now those are switching predominantly to hair breeds. In general, the hair breeds are a smaller animal and they mature at much lighter weight than the wool breeds. In my experience, um, hair breeds have been popular in um, New York State in the area. They're easy care. You don't need to worry about um, the wool. Um, you may not need to worry as much about parasites. So they've been a popular choice. Um, that does not mean that um, you can't choose a wool breed or a, a some sort of cross, um, but we have not had experience with wool breeds, um, to my knowledge, on, on solar sites. So it's just been a popular choice. Um, wool, excuse me, hair breeds are also very popular among ethnic communities in Northeast and Eastern United States. So that might be a reason of accessible markets for that choice. Maybe um, Lewis can speak more to that, but it's, it's a big topic and it's, it's a, a complicated evolving topic, the wool versus the hair breeds. Um, but any sheep is a wonderful sheep. I can't discriminate. <laughs> Thank you, Julie. That's great. And, and I'd probably be remiss if I didn't ask Nick Armantrout, his opinion on, on wool breeds. He's got a background <laughs> in the wool industry. So Nick. yes, he would know more than me. <laughs> I don't know about that, Julie, but I, I guess the only thing I'd, I'd add is that um, there haven't been uh, for a number of years, a lot of different markets to take shorn fiber um, in the Northeast. Those markets are smaller. Um, so there, and there hasn't been some of the critical infrastructure to support shearing itself in case, in some cases there aren't enough shearers, um, uh, let alone places in a smaller scale to scour wool and to add various, you know, converted processing to make finished products. However, there has been in the past, and there can be again in the future. Um, and there, there is a hope that where uh, solar grazing is an opportunity for uh, the sheep industry as a whole, there may be a, an opportunity as well um, for wool sheep and and wool fiber, um, because it's a just as timely a time to think of. Um, the positive regener regenerative fiber that can come from solar as well as the food. So there's a lot of hope about it and uh, American sheep industry is working on it as well as all kinds of different fiber sheds and sheep producers here in the Northeast hoping to affect a change and start to produce more wool and be able to process our own wool here in the Northeast. So if you know investors, have them send some questions because we need the help. I love that you brought that up, Nick. Um, that was something that we we got to talk a little bit about in the research um, was, you know, as New York State is pushing some of these um, different, you know, climate agendas, but um, building materials. And I had actually had a conversation with some developers who were using wool as insulation um, in, in buildings. So, you know, I, I love that you brought that up that, you know, we should be thinking about all parts of, of the lamb as we think about, you know, the climate agenda in New York. 
Thank you everybody for weighing in on that. Um, the next question is from Michelle. Um, I think I can take this one. Uh, the question is, is there a minimum ground clearance so the sheep can graze under the panels? Uh, does the site need to be fenced? I'm trying to limit fencing of solar sites so wild animals can continue to move through these areas normally. Um, the short answer to the first question is no, I wouldn't say there's a minimum ground clearance. Um, typically, you know, grazing and everything else works a little bit better with a little bit of a higher mounted panel. Um, but we do in our grazing business, you know, manage uh, some, some very, very short sites. Um, so um, it does not necessarily, necessarily preclude uh, sheep grazing. Um, and on the second question, does the site need to be fenced? Um, the answer is yes. And, and that's because um, federal energy code mandates that they have to be fenced. Um, and certainly when we're thinking about sheep grazing, we really have to keep in mind predator pressure. Um, you know, a lot of things like to eat sheep. Um, so <clears throat> secure site fencing is very important to the safety of the sheep. Um, and generally one of the reasons that sheep work very well on solar sites is because they do have secure fencing. So um, those things kind of go hand in hand there. But I will say anecdotally, um, we manage a lot of different solar sites. We see, we see a lot of different wildlife on solar sites that, that will get in um, regardless of the fence. We've got, um, we, we see a lot of foxes nesting on, on solar sites. Um, you know, usually a lot of ground nesting birds, um, birds making nests in the panels. Um, a lot of rodents, you know, what have you. So we do see, we do see a lot of that activity. I can say anecdotally. Um, question about the solar grazing compensation of $250 an acre. Is this competitive with the cost of mowing? Could you speak to the incentive for the solar developer operator to choose grazing over mowing and the implications for grazer profitability? Um, I can answer this to some extent, and then I don't know if Kevin has some comments too, but um, um, you know, on the solar grazing compensation of $250 an acre, there's, you know, a limited amount of data points for this. Um, we have some, um, myself, we do graze, you know, quite a few solar sites. Um, we know through the American Solar Grazing Association, a good amount of people, you know, grazing solar sites and across the country. Cornell has done some work on this in their survey uh, they've done of that. So taking all of that together, um, you know, typically the smaller sites that we graze now in New York have a little bit of a higher rate per acre. Um, but, you know, we've, we've felt that, you know, for a number of reasons, being competitive with mowing, um, which we do have to be, um, you know, bringing this down to around the $250 an acre mark is more realistic. Um, as Kevin said, you know, this is something that's going to have to have price discovery when, when these sites actually start getting built in New York. Um, but for other parts of the country, I think this tracks pretty well. Um, and maybe Kevin, do you want to speak to the incentive from the solar developer angle? Yeah, so the, the sites that we are doing in Ontario, uh, it's actually more cost effective to hire farmers to graze sheep under the panels to maintain our vegetation than it is to pay a landscaping mowing company. And I know, I think the market dynamics are a little bit different in Ontario than they are in New York state. And again, we just have to go through some price discovery. And for example, um, you know, do we need to mow one time, two times, three times per year? So the amount of times we need to mow per year, um, you know, that, that makes a difference. Um, but also if we're gonna be using a lot of farmland in New York state to site solar panels, um, finding ways to incorporate farming in, into the, those solar areas, um, I think will be important going forward. Um, and the other thing too, as mentioned before, is there's also a lower bar to entry for new farmers um, to do solar grazing versus, um, versus grazing maybe their own land that they have to rent or buy. Uh, in this case, we're paying them to graze. So, so that really helps with their economics um, to, to get started. Thanks, Kevin. Um, the next question. Uh, from Dave DeYoung is, has the Office of Renewable Energy Siting provided any input on what production methods are approved forms of agricultural mitigation for utility scale solar sites? Is sheep grazing acceptable? Are pollinator plantings acceptable? Um, I think we've still kind of yet to see this bear out. Um, I don't know, Kevin, if you've got any more input there. Yeah, I think when we talk about agrivoltaics, um, 
just having pollinator plantings and, and pollinators on site isn't seen as being enough. Um, so it really has to get into you know, grazing or having crops or, or different things like that on, on site to really um, make a difference and be able to call your site agrivoltaic. Thanks, Kevin. Um, the next question from Ron is, uh, since the sheep grazing is so profitable, can't the solar development companies invest in them and help kickstart the business? Um, I'd welcome anybody that wants to take a swing at this. I can um, say from my perspective, um, what we know is that we, we, there are some developers um, kind of in that conversation in the US now. There's some you know operations and maintenance firms that have also looked at um, owning their own flocks and managing uh, their own sites that way. Um, so this is something that that is being done to some extent. Um, but we're also seeing quite a bit of interest from farmers themselves. And, and um, you know, um, my own farming business, we've been doing this for a number of years. And it's been, you know, it's been a very good experience for us. And in, in, in terms of, you know, farm viability, um, it's been tremendous. Um, so we do see, I would say, quite a bit of interest um, from farmers and growing their flocks to do this. And we also do see um, some solar developers and operations and maintenance providers um, starting to look at, you know, entering the business a little bit as well. Um, the next question from Mary, thanks for, thanks for providing a virtual site tour. Our boards are interested in data on locations and size of solar ag co-location sites in New York State. Are there lists of New York State locations or a map of locations and details? Um, I believe the short answer to this is no. Um, there are a, a, one of the good resources to find some of these sites and, and inquire about site tours would be um, <clears throat> probably the American Solar Grazing Association, um, which does have a pretty robust member directory and um, you know some, some message boards where um, you could probably connect um, with solar grazers and trying to line up some in-person site tours. That's something that we've done from time to time. It's, um, you know, something that is very helpful and, and, you know, getting people on a site and letting them see that in person, that's, that's certainly helpful. So I would, I would say, look to the uh, Solar Grazing Association. That would be a good place to start. Uh, from Peter, what is the minimum amount of sheep you would have to graze to break even? Um, I, I can take this and say that the short answer to that is it really depends on the sheep producer and the farmer. Um, you know, different, different farms have different, you know, business structures and, and different cost structures. So for somebody, maybe it makes sense to graze a one acre site next door um, or a smaller site that's close by. Um, you know, certainly there's... Um, price, there's efficiencies and, and cost breaks when you graze larger sites. And so more investment in, in different infrastructure like water and equipment and trucks make more sense and, and kind of have to be scaled to match that. Um, but, you know, depending on the size of your business, different opportunities can certainly make sense. We ourselves, we graze a number of very small sites um, and we graze sites right now up to about 150 acres. So um, different sites can certainly, different size sites can certainly make sense um, from the farmer perspective. From Joe, are there any classes available online at any universities on agrivoltaics and dual use solar farming uh, or classes from organizations, especially more geared towards uh, growing of crops under the panels such as vegetables or short stature crops? I don't know if I could say that I know of any off, off the top of my head. Does, it, does anybody else want to take a swing at this? We often see like, like classes and conferences and there's a series of a lot of webinars like the American Solar Grazing Association has a lot of webinars where you can get information. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know, Lewis, I, I thought there might've been a course at one of the universities somewhere. No. I, it sounds a little bit familiar. Um, yeah, I, I'd be happy to look at it. If Joe, if you if you want to follow up with somebody, I I can I can look into it and see what I can find. I'd be happy. Joe, to you can 
you can follow up with me, Eva here. Um, and I do want to say that USIS is looking into further studies supporting vegetables and um, short crops under uh, the panels and would like to organize another event to cover that in the near future. So we hope to find something as well. Thanks, Eva. Um, Julie, this might be a question for you. Um, if the upfront cost is 250,000, stocking rate is three sheep per acre site is 1,000 acres and the annual profit is 78,000, then the annual profit is 78,000 and the payback would be at least 3.2 years, right? Hi, yes. Um... I'd, I'd have to defer to the original study. Um, I think that the payoff was less than that, about a, um, a year or so. Um, I'll have to look at the numbers again, kind of got me off guard, but I, I think that the return is higher and the payoff lower than your, what you suggested. I'm actually, and I'm seeing, I think this might've been answered in the chat. I think there might've been a mix up between the two different scenarios. Okay, so, okay. Yeah. Yes, um, I understand that my presentation was was very brief. I encourage you all to go look at the original study and particularly look at the assumptions that we made. It is a utility scale site. It's unlike um, anything we've seen in previous literature. So there are a lot of assumptions and it's a it's a much larger scale than we're we're used to, but um, it it might be very much the future of solar grazing. So. Thank you for your interest and, and please um, look up the original report. Thanks, Julie. Um, the next question is from Jennifer. Uh, is the Electronet fencing tapped off at the solar at all? Would one want to provide some extra receptacles at the combiner boxes? What kind of power specs do these fences use? Um, I, can, I can speak to this a little bit. Um, there are solar fencers that are you know, self-contained solar powered fence chargers. Um, there are also solar, or there are also fence chargers that um, are just 110 plug-in chargers. Um, some sites that we see do have some auxiliary power available at the combiner boxes. Um, that's something that's, you know, certainly very helpful for, for grazers. Um, what kind of power specs do these fences use? Um, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. I don't know if anybody else here can either, but if, if you can, let me know. Um, but I think it's something you could look up pretty easily. It's not much. It's, uh, it's certainly not much. Um, Dave DeYoung, can you elaborate on what the actual opportunity for sheep grazing uh, slash agrivoltaics is? If a large utility scale site is not available in a sheep farmer's area, what are their options? Do they graze several small sites? that would add trucking costs to move sheep from site to site or travel between sites for monitoring animal care. How many thousand acre sites are actually available for sheep grazing? Um, I can take a swing at this as well. Um, it's, you know, certainly true that in New York at this point, you know, typically the bread and butter of people who are grazing solar sites is, is smaller sites, community scale sites. Um, our business, that's, that's what we do. We graze, uh, sites that are generally anywhere from, you know, 10 to 50 acres. Um, and, and, you know, this year we're looking at somewhere between six and 700 acres broken up on, you know, a lot of those very small sites. So that's right now in New York, it's what's built. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of people have their eye on, on utility scale sites. Um, the economics are different. Um, the logistics are different. It's, you know, a little bit of a different business, um, you know, but in other parts of the country, there are people, you know, grazing sites of, you know, that thousand acre size um, and doing it quite effectively. You know, we see that in the Northeast and in the Midwest, you know, Southeast and in the West. So environments that are, you know, anywhere from very, very dry desert uh, environments where you're grazing for more fire prevention um, to, you know, the Southeast where you've got extreme vegetation growth. And, and so, you know, sheep are pretty, sheep are pretty, you know, adaptable to different situations and, you know, different management techniques. So um, hopefully that and Lewis, answers the that. second yeah. part of that question, if we look at New York state alone, you know, we're just going to start to see now larger and larger sites of the thousand acre type 
start to um, start construction and start to be operational maybe in the next two to three years across New York State. And you know it's not inconceivable that in the next five years there could be a dozen or more large sites like that across New York State. And I, I know that they're also propping up in different um, states around the country. Thanks, Kevin. Um, there's two questions in a row that might be good uh, for Nicole. Um, the first one is, are you seeing any product price increases for solar lamb or is the market too new? Um, and the second one, is there a point of lamb market saturation in New York? Yeah, so the, for the first one, I think it's, and this really came out more, um, I would say in the B um, portion in the honey production portion of our, of our research. Um, people really have no idea what, you know, it means for something to be solar raised. Um, and so right now, I mean, at least in, you know, the work that we did, we didn't see any, um, you know, difference, but absolutely when, you know, you kind of look at um, the way that organic has been marketed and, you know, other types of products that there's certainly a potential for it. And that, you know, was in recommendations for, you know, continuing research um, to look at, you know, the potential of that because, um, you know, in the future when there is more knowledge and there is more education and awareness around this, um, I think that there certainly could be the opportunity there. Um, I forgot what was the second question about lamb penetration. Yeah, the second one um, would be, you know, is there a point of market saturation for lamb in New York? And and you know, I don't know if you could answer that from the the processed lamb standpoint. Or um... I'll I might have to pull Julian to this one. She has a much more global understanding of um, the market for lamb um, and what that that could potentially be. Thank you, Nicole. Um, Nicole mentioned earlier in her presentation that we conducted an informal survey of ethnic buyers in the area. And um, it was just a, a very small sample, but um, several buyers asked me right away, do you have lambs available now? When are they available? I want them now. So I was really encouraged that no, the, the market is not saturated. And um, lamb demand is very strong, particularly among ethnic buyers. They are shipping lambs from Texas up to New York State, um, from the Southeast up to New York State. Lambs are a hot com commodity. Thank you, um, Nicole and Julie. Um, there's a question from Todd. Uh, what retrofits are required to the PV facility to protect both the livestock and the equipment? Um, there's, you know, I could I could speak to this a little bit, and Kevin probably can as well. Um, there are, you know, a number of areas that you know are looked at when you're when you're looking at making a solar site, you know, hospital hospitable for sheep. Um, you know, a lot of sites work fine, you know, as built, um, we do graze a lot of sites that are, you know, not necessarily designed for sheep. Um, you know, there are some considerations of areas to exclude the sheep from, you know, on, around some electrical equipment, um, but generally not from a damage perspective, necessarily more of a cleanliness perspective. And, and, you know, typically sheep don't have chewing behavior or are not too inquisitive, you know, whereas something, like uh, a, a goat might be. Um, so sheep are pretty well um, behaved um, and their behavior fits in pretty well with, with solar facilities. Yeah, and I think Lewis, the other part here is to make sure that our fence around the facility itself is really close to the ground, right? You only wanna have, what is it, no more than a couple inches or something like that between the ground and the bottom of the fence to prevent predators from entering the site. So that's maybe one of the more important considerations when it comes to protecting that livestock. That's absolutely right. Um, this might be Nicole as well. Uh, are there any list of stores that sell local raised lamb? So some of the um, 
you know, uh, distributors that we um, interviewed for the survey, like Palmer's, um, McCann's Meats, um, do carry um, locally raised meats, um, but I don't have a list right off the the top of my head. And um, you know, I know that um, you know one of the the retailers we would hope to connect with Wegmans. Um, we did not get a response, but. Um, uh, yeah, hopefully that um, it will become more and more and more common. Great. Thank you, Nicole. Um, and I think we're at 730. Um, I think we're going to have to wrap up here um, in the interest of time, but um, appreciate yeah, just, all the panelists that have. Yep, go ahead, Julie. Sorry, Lewis. I just I'd like to add uh, just in conclusion that the American Lamb Board is a tremendous resource for finding domestic lamb, finding recipes for domestic lamb, and I believe also processors. And they might even have um, some, some lists of, of potential food service vendors and retailers, I don't recall. But don't forget the American Lamb Board is funded by your checkoff dollars, and it has tremendous amount of resources available online. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. Um, I believe if there's, you know, follow up or, or additional questions, um, you can reach out to uh, Eva at uh, USIS. Absolutely. Um, if you have any further questions, uh, please email usesny at gmail.com or eva at usesusa.org. And um, questions that have already been posted will be recorded and we will be able to take them down, put them in a Word document, and we'll be able to blast the answers out to all of you. So if you already asked your question, we can address it. And then if you have any further ones, please send them to me. Um, thank you so much for joining us tonight and um, have a great rest of your evening. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you. Great job, Lewis. Thank you. Thank you.